I want to open this morning with a question. Rhetorical. But what makes a person famous? Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about flavor of the month famous or fireworks famous. I'm not even talking about a, a fame specific to one scene or trend or group of people. I'm not referring to a Kardashian level of celebrity, nor am I alluding to a notoriety specific, let's say, even to Americana. Michael, Elvis, Monroe, Jobs, or Gates. I, instead, I'm talking about a multi-generational, cross-cultural, global type of fame that spans and transcends language, location, and time. If you were to Google top 10 famous people of all time in the world, you will notice two things about this search result. Aside from a couple givens, almost every person that makes this list they're, they're unique. Now, there's not a, a, a uniform system to evaluate fame, but, but in almost all cases, there is a commonality about the people that make these type of lists. You see, to be truly famous, you have to have done something that transcends yourself. It's a chief characteristic of fame. To be famous in this global sense, you have to accomplish to steal a phrase, something huge. For example, to be famous, you would, you would have needed to lead a political revolution, like Alexander or Napoleon, Washington or Mao. Make a literary contribution to the world, like Shakespeare or Twain, Dickens or Poe. You would have had to have fostered a movement within the arts, like Leonardo, Michelangelo, Beethoven or Mozart. You would have had to have invented something to make any of these lists, invent something that's important, like Newton or Bell, Ford or Edison. You would have had to have developed some type of a groundbreaking scientific theory, like Galileo, Darwin, Einstein, or Hawking. Contribute a philosophical idea, like Aristotle or Socrates, Paul, Marx, Nietzsche or Freud. You would have had to have initiated a radical social change, Something big, like Lincoln, or Gandhi, or Luther, Cromwell, Mandela, or MLK. To be famous in this global sense, no doubt, you would have had to have created a religious movement, in much the same way that Jesus did, or Buddha, or Muhammad, Confucius, or Moses. Even doing something particular infamous would get you on the list, like Hitler, or Stalin. But my point is that generally speaking, to achieve this type of fame, you would have needed to lead, write, create, invent, or develop something so noteworthy and lasting that your name would be known by all for all time. On, on an aside note, to make any of these lists, you'd have to be so famous you could be known by just one word. I bring this up to say that there is one fascinating exception to this rule. There was a man who, interestingly enough, didn't invent anything. He, he gave society no scientific contribution. A man that led no philosophical work, movement, wasn't a revolutionary, wasn't a, an agent of social change. This was a man that, that didn't start a religion, didn't discover a new land. He, he wasn't infamous and is instead, ironically, almost universally held in high regard by every major world religion. That's saying something. And yes, this man too is also known by one name, Abraham. Like it really is amazing to consider a man who lived 4,500 years ago, give or take, who didn't possess a country, whose entire life was spent as a nomad, who was a shepherd by trade, who wrote absolutely nothing down, and had no intention of starting a religious movement, is beloved across the globe. It's strange. According to listverse.com, Abraham is the third most famous person of all time behind Jesus and Muhammad, and directly in front of Moses and Buddha. Because Abraham is revered by all three mono, monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, 
as well as being considered a prophet by others. There are an astounding, check this out, two million books written about Abraham. And over 9.1 million Google searches using Abraham's name every month. It's a lot of searching. Listverse.com concludes, quote, Among well over 99% of the world's cultures and societies, you will not have a problem when asking about the prophet called Abraham. He has incredible name recognition. As it pertains to the Old Testament, Abraham is mentioned 215 times. Additionally, he's mentioned in the New Testament another 74 times. And while we don't consider the Quran to be scripture, obviously, just for reference, Abraham is mentioned there another 188 times. As far as his contributions to our faith, the Christian faith is considered, Abraham's significance really can't be underestimated. In James chapter 2, verse 23, Abraham is called uniquely the friend of God. The Apostle Paul will also refer to Abraham as being the father of all those who believe and the father of the faith. He says this in Romans 4. For our purposes this morning, I want you to consider very quickly what exactly made Abraham so significant. And the answer may actually surprise you. What makes Abraham so significant? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And what's even stranger about Abraham is that the book of Genesis records more of the man's failures then it does his triumphs. Honestly, in light of the 74 times Abraham surfaces in the New Testament, I've reached the conclusion that this is actually the point of Abraham's life. Now, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. It's not a knock against Abraham. On the contrary, I find myself more convinced than ever that it's his failures that make Abraham so beloved. Of all the biblical characters, Abraham is not only written about more than anyone else, but it's because of this that he's, he just he comes across very relatable. And he's relatable mainly because of what his life ultimately represented. You see, Abraham goes down as the one guy known not for what he did or said, but rather who he knew. It's who he knew that made Abraham so famous. Abraham's story begins with him as a pagan idolater who was actually saved by God's grace, much in the same way you and I. Abraham was saved before he he did anything to deserve it or before he did any work to earn it. The scriptures are clear that God chose Abraham even before Abraham chose God. And then while Abraham's life would be characterized more by his failure to obey God than his successes, because Abraham placed his faith and the promise of a Savior, God's grace never failed to sustain him. No wonder he's relatable, and no, no wonder we admire him. I bring up Abraham in way of introduction, because John chapter 8, where we are in this this sermon that Jesus is giving, there on the Temple Mount, near the treasury, a sermon that is filled with a lot of back and forth with a group of religious leaders that didn't like him at all. Jesus here, where we are in the sermon, moving forward to the end, is about to articulate several ideas that are tied to Abraham. In a sense, you actually need to understand Abraham to understand what Jesus is saying. In response to to Jesus' statement in in verse 32 of John 8, concerning those who believed, stating that they would know the truth and the truth would set them free, the religious leaders, they respond this way. We read that, that they say, we are Abraham's descendants. This is their argument. And have never been in bondage to everyone, to anyone. That's blatantly not not true. They're forgetting, you know, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Greeks, presently the Romans. But they say, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? 
So Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We'll get to this in more detail next Sunday. But then Jesus makes this fascinating statement that we have to unpack. He says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Now, maybe underline the word descendants. But you seek to kill me. Why? Because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father. And you do what you have seen with your father. So they answered and said to them, Abraham... Abraham is our father. But Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, different word, you might want to underline it, you would do the works of Abraham. Now, ultimately, in this passage, Jesus is making an important distinction. He's saying that there was a fundamental core difference between being a descendant of Abraham and being a child of Abraham. The two are not mutually exclusive, nor do they specifically tie. Jesus would use here in John 8 two different words to differentiate them. A child of Abraham, how would we know? What makes a child of Abraham? Well, Jesus says, a child of Abraham would do the works of Abraham. This is what distincts, makes a distinction between a descendant and a child, doing the works of Abraham. Now, to unpack what work Jesus is referring to, I want to take us back to the origins of Abraham's walk with God because the answer may surprise you. Now, as you're working your way through Genesis, and you find yourself transitioning from the events of Babel, God's scattering of the nations, you get to the last few verses of Genesis 11, and your attention gets brought back to a genealogy, a family listing, that specifically of one of Noah's sons, a son named Shem. It's important to the overarching narrative of Genesis. The end of chapter 11, the beginning of chapter 12, you could actually divide the Bible into that place. It's very important. Now, tr- following the tragic events of Genesis 9, Noah. Noah makes several important prophetic pronouncements concerning two of his sons, as well as his wicked grandson named Canaan, specifically for our purposes. In Genesis 9, verse 26... Noah says, he declares prophetically, Blessed be the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the God of Shem. Not only does this statement indicate that Shem shared Noah's heart concerning the true and the living God, but in the macro sense, it would appear that it would be Shem's lineage, his family tree of the three sons, that would ultimately include the Savior of of the world, a savior who had been promised back to Adam and Eve going into Genesis 3, verse 15. Now, the last few verses of Genesis 11 are important. Here's why. They connect Shem to a man named Abraham. Let's look at it. Verse 27 of Genesis 11, we're told that this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot, and Haran died before his father Terah in his native land, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abraham, Abram, who will be known as Abraham, and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, later to be known as Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ithcah. But Sarah was barren, she had no child. And, and Terah took his son Abram, and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarah, Abraham's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, this passage, it seems very straightforward. But you need to understand that there is a lot happening in these verses that you might not just see with a cursory reading. For starters, I don't know if you picked up on it, probably didn't, but what's being described in these verses is not a good dynamic at all. The descendants of Shem, the genealogy of Terah, Abraham's father, who had received this incredible blessing from Noah, had made a decision to settle in an area known as Ur of the Chaldeans. Now what makes that significant? 
is that while we're told God scattered the nations from Babel, this tells us the godly lineage of Shem, well, they didn't go very far. As a matter of fact, they kind of stayed on the same block. The city of Ur was located in the very region of Babel, Mesopotamia, just a few miles south. According to archaeologists, the ancient city of Ur was founded around 2100 B.C. and quickly grew to be vibrant. It had a large population, eclipsing somewhere around 24,000, huge in that time, of time period. The city was not only wealthy because of its abundance of natural resources and access to the Euphrates River, but Ur of the Chaldeans boasted a prominent ziggurat, similar to what Nimrod had constructed in Babel, a tower to the sky. Archaeological digs have also shown that the city of Ur, during Abraham's time, was actually an advanced society. It had a steady economy, and it had a, a particular emphasis on educational learning. But beyond that, because of the ziggurat, Ur was steeped in idolatry and the pagan worship of Nana, N-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, the moon god. Now, Nana was known, actually, and for you history buffs, you'll connect the dots. But Nana was known by a particular symbol. That symbol being the crescent moon. And was worshipped by nomadic tribes across Mesopotamia all the way up until the 7th century AD. When Muhammad renamed the moon god from Nana to Allah. Which was already a name accepted by these very pagan cultures. Now, regardless... Jewish legend claims that Terah and his family had grown wealthy, making and selling idols to Nana and Ur of the Chaldeans. In actuality, there is some biblical evidence to support this. In Joshua 24, verse 2, we're told, Thus the Lord God of Israel, this is what he says, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, they dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. The reason this presents a tragic turn of events is that the family of Shem had seemingly abandoned the worship of the true and living God, the God of their fathers, and, how, and had diverged into idolatry. Abraham was an idolater. And yet, in spite of all of this, something happens in, in the text. Now, it's not in the text. It's not explained there in these final verses of Genesis 11. But something happens that causes the patriarch, Terah, to uproot his family and his fortune and migrate 600 miles northwest, settling in another ancient city dedicated to the, the worship of the moon god, the city of Haran, located in what is today called Turkey. It was a crossroads between the east and the west. Now, for a greater understanding of what happens to cause this move, not explained in Genesis 11, I want you to turn your attention to Acts chapter 7. Because in the midst of a sermon that Stephen is giving in front of a group of religious men, the very men Jesus is talking to in John 8, a group of men who will take him outside the city at the end of this sermon and stone him. It was a good sermon, and he still got stoned for it. It's encouraging. Getting stoned by the audience doesn't mean it was a bad sermon. can mean it's a good one. But this is what Stephen says. Follow me. He says, Brothers and fathers, verse 2, chap chapter 7, book of Acts, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Where? When he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then Abraham came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father died, he moved to this land which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, Stephen says, not even enough to set his foot on. But when Abraham had no child, God promised to give it to him as a possession to his descendants after him. Now, it appears when you take these passages into account, that what motivated this move from Ur to the promised land, now, now they, they go to Haran, but what prompted the move was that God 
Jehovah God, the Lord, appeared not to Terah, but appears to Abraham while he's in Ur. And what does this God say? God tells Abraham, commands him, according to Stephen, to leave his country, to leave his relatives, in order to come to a land that God would show him. And consider, just on an aside, what prompted this appearing of God. Did God appear to Abraham because Abraham was seeking God? No, in in no way do either passage imply that was the case. Did God call Abraham because he was worthy? You can't make that, that case either. Abraham, at the time of God's appearing, was what? He was a pagan profiteering off the worship of false gods. Beyond that, Scripture indicates that Abraham himself was an idolater when he was living in the land of Ur. Understand, and this is a core concept of critical importance, but Stephen's larger point to the Jewish leaders was that there was nothing inherent to Abraham or his character that precipitated God's appearing or God's calling. God appeared to Abraham, called him for one reason, his grace and his grace alone. This is what ticked off his audience, which is why they later stoned him to death. God's grace prompted God to choose, appear, and call Abraham out of Ur. Again, while our text here in Genesis 11 doesn't specifically tell us this, the authors of the New Testament provide more context to what's even happening within the minutia. In addition to appearing to Abraham, which is incredible, I won't bore you with a full recap of Genesis, the first 12 chapters, but this appearing of God to Abraham is the first appearing of God to man since the Garden of Eden. It's a significant event. But it seems that God's command to leave Ur and his family, according to the New Testament authors, to go to a land he could possess, that God also gave him a much larger understanding and picture of his plan. Now, follow me here. We don't get this in Genesis 11, but we get this in other places of Scripture. In Romans 4, verse 3, and James 2, verse 23, we're told by both Paul the Apostle and James the half-brother of Jesus that Abraham in Ur, when God appeared, believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So the question begs, what belief was of such significance that it would take an idolatrous Abraham and immediately make him righteous Abraham before God, even before he leaves Ur of the Chaldeans. In writing about Abraham in Galatians 3, Paul, he adds an interesting detail that demands our attention, for it it answers this question and gives us insight into this work that makes a child, makes a person a child of Abraham. Paul writes in Galatians 3, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached, notice this, the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, and you all the nations shall be blessed, so then those who are of faith are blessed by believing Abraham. Did you catch that? First, those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. It's not about your family lineage. You don't have to be a Hebrew or a Jew. It's not about your genealogy or your ethnicity. That is not what makes you a child of Abraham, while it might make you a descendant. What makes you a child of Abraham is faith. Faith in what? Faith in a promise, which leads to my second point. We're told here that God preached what to Abraham? Like, what was the message? The gospel, literally the good news. While a pagan idolater living in Ur, God appears to Abram and not only tells him to go to a land of promise, which was kind of secondary, actually. 
What changed it for Abraham was that God revealed that that move was necessary because God wanted to provide through his family lineage a savior of the world. That's the good news. The reason they left Ur of the Chaldeans was because Abraham believed God's word and decided to place his faith in the gospel message. God's promise of a savior. And it was in that very moment, understand, before he even leaves Ur, it was in that moment that Abraham, the Bible tells us unequivocally, was made righteous. Again, don't miss what God was promising to Abram. While in a literal sense, it's true that God was promising to grow Abraham's actual descendants into a mighty nation, we would call the Jews or the Hebrews. And though it's true that God was promising a specific land that that nation, that group of people would inherit, we call it Israel. The reality is that these promises transcend their practical fulfillment. If you filter these promises through the prism of much larger realities, that it would be through Abraham's family that God would provide a savior, the nation that's being described, It transcends just Hebrews. And the land is not specific to just Cana. Please know this. Jesus will talk about it in John 8. Let me give you two other passages to help build the framework here. Again, in Galatians 3, Paul says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. You can't get more clear than that. Then in Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10, we're told by faith... Abraham dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now notice what they're waiting for, the actual promised land. They're waiting for, quote, the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So when we talk about being a child of Abraham, we're not talking about just being Jewish. Something more to that, faith. And when we're talking about the land that God promised Abraham, we're not just talking about a plot of turf we call Israel. We're talking about heaven, the land. It's more than just a a track of real estate off the Mediterranean. The nation describes all who, like Abraham, believe God's word, place their faith into Jesus, and choose to walk with him instead of settling in this world, something that applies both to Jew, to Gentile, to Hispanic, fill in the blanks. Now seeing that this work that Jesus is referencing in John 8 ties to the faith of Abraham, which makes you more than a descendant, you're a child. There's another point of clarity that needs to be made. Well, on account of God's grace, Abraham did believe and place his faith in this promise of a Savior. Abraham (laughs) failed to be obedient. He was made righteous, and then he immediately falls flat on his face. Now, Stephen, look at it. Stephen is clear that God commanded Abraham, while he was in Ur, to do what? To get out of your country and from your relatives, and come to a land that I will show you. Genesis 11 tells us what? That it was Terah that takes his son Abraham, grandson Lot, Sarah, Abram's wife. They leave Ur, and they they go towards the land of Canaan, but they settle in Haran. Now, there is no question that they start off with the right destination in mind, the land of Canaan. But they came to Haran, and they chose to dwell there. Like, make no bones about it. In Isaiah 51, verse 2, we're told that God called Abraham alone. Literally, that's what God says through Isaiah the prophet. He didn't call Terah, didn't call Lot. He called Abraham to leave his family and go to a new land. But he doesn't. He continues on with his father, Terah, and nephew Lot. Like it would appear, as you put all these things together, that while the marching orders were clear, 
God was up front about it. This family connection was something that Abraham couldn't let go of. Even after Terah dies, Abraham will still allow his nephew Lot to travel with him. Spoiler alert, that doesn't end well either. Like, regardless, what we can say for sure, Abraham was called to go to the land of Canaan, but because he failed to be fully obedient to God's command to get out from his relatives, he ends up settling in Haran until his father Terah dies. It's not an accident that the word Terah, the name Terah, it means delay. Talk about being prophetic. Haran, it means parched or barren. Abraham was righteous before God. The Bible's clear. In Ur, he believed a promise. And then he messes up. He doesn't obey. And this time in Haran was unfruitful and completely unproductive to God's plan for his life. In Haran, Abraham, still righteous, but practically God's plan was limited because he failed to obey God's word. Now that leads us to Genesis 12. Verse 1 we read, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, all their possessions that they had gathered and all the people they had acquired in Haran, they departed to go to the land of Canaan. They came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place known as Shechem, as far as the Terebeth tree of Moreh. Canaanites dwelt in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So Abraham built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. He pitched his tent with Bethel. On the west, Ai on the east, he built an altar called on the Lord. You can continue the story on your own. We know, according to Stephen, that God initially called Abraham in Ur. But because Abraham failed to be obedient, he spent countless fruitless years in Haran until dear old dad killed over. Then when dad dies... What happens? Well, Genesis 12 says, now the Lord said, so so God reappears. And then a few verses later, and Abraham departs from Haran. Now, Don't miss this. Now the Lord said, these nine verses of Genesis 12 imply, like the word that the Lord said, that God was continuing to say. It wasn't as though... Terah dies, God reappears. Apparently, this message was continual. In a profound way, while Abraham may have taken a detour because of his failure to obey God and his word, God's grace still remains sure and Abraham's calling secure. In actuality, the case can be made that this calling of God through the entire stretch of Abraham's disobedience Happened over and over and over. This voice in his, in his soul, and his heart. I know I need to get going. I know I need to leave. And then his dad dies. He's like, I got to move. Amazing. Notice in this passage that God is reiterating three promises. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing to all the families of the earth. To this passage, David Guzik writes in his commentary, quote, there are promises of God, notice how often God says, I will, in these verses. Genesis 11, Guzik writes, is all about the plans of man. Genesis chapter 12 is all about the plans of God. Now here's the big lesson Abraham's life illustrates for us. And don't miss this. The works of Abraham that Jesus refers to The works of Abraham that determine if you're Abraham's child cannot be attributed 
to the successes of Abraham. That is not the work that Jesus is pointing to. Abraham's successes were few and far between. Instead, the work of Abraham that makes you a child of Abraham is a willingness to abide in God's grace when you failed. Like Abraham's story centers on a belief in a savior and not his ability to obey. It was a belief in a savior and not his obedience that manifested a right standing before God. In closing, notice how God evaluates Abraham's life. When it's all said and done, Hebrews chapter 11, we have what's called the great hall of faith. And this is, this is the evaluation of Abraham's entire life. We're told by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. Wait a second. I'll just reread that. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelt in tents, and we, we read. <laughs> Do you notice what's missing in God's evaluation of Abraham's life? The entire detour in Haran, is it mentioned? No, nope, not at all. Matter of fact, if it wasn't for Stephen, we wouldn't know about it. Sure, there was some words in heaven between Stephen and Abraham. Come on, man, you sold me out. Are any of Abraham's failings mentioned? How about you know the trip to, to Egypt? When Abraham, you know, kind of gets freaked out because his, his wife was a babe. And so instead of defending her, he's like, Yeah, she's my sister. You could take her. You know, real manly of Abraham. That included? No. How about keeping Lot around? We end up with a world war because Abraham kept Lot around. Hagar, Ishmael. Like, we're still dealing with the repercussions of that mistake. Is it mentioned? Nope. Abimelech. There's a whole story about Abimelech. Also, not mentioned. None of his failings are recorded. Why is that? Because Abraham was already righteous before God on account of his faith and a coming Savior. Abraham's failings, though consequential, had no bearing on his status in heaven. That's what makes him so relatable. You know, the same is true with David, King David. You know, you have 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. And if you're reading through these things, you get to 1 and 2 Chronicles, and it's, it's a repeating of like all of the history you just spent four books reading. You're like, thanks for this. A lot of repetition. You know what it is, actually? The, the belief about 1 and 2 Chronicles is that it was, it was written and compiled by by Ezra, much later on. Matter of fact, after the Babylonian captivity, those 70 years, when the people returned to the land, Ezra, who was one of the people involved in all this, chronicles. This is what God wants you to know of your history. That's what First and Second Chronicles are. It's actually God's view of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Okay, you tracking with me? Now, if you know anything of King David's story, we're told he had, he had the heart after God. And yet, when kings should be in war, what is David doing? He's up top with some binoculars checking out Bathsheba bathing. He's like, that chick is hot. Yo, servants, go get, bring her to me. And he commits adultery. She comes back like, yo, Dave, I'm pregnant. Well, that's a problem because her husband, yes, she has a husband. This is adultery. You can stone someone for death. 
So David compounds one mistake with what? He brings back one of his mighty men of valor from the front lines. He tries to get him hammered so that he can go sleep with his wife and never know that he had slept with his wife. When this man has more integrity and nobility and won't go into his house because his men are still on the front lines, David sends, gives him a letter. And in the letter, it says, advance and then retreat so he's left alone. He sets up his assassination. Gives him the letter to carry it because he was a man of that kind of integrity. David commits adultery, kills someone and covers it up. Whole story's a mess. Not included in 1st or 2nd Chronicles. When God evaluated, God decided what? And when the Bible says that God casts your sin as far as the east is from the west, it's a play on words. If God said, I'm going to cast your sin as far as the north, it's to the south. You can measure that. That means Santa is going to get a list of whether you are naughty or nice. Instead, it's to the east because you go east and you just keep going east. You know, it's a circle. I hate to, like, I got to reiterate that these days, but the globe is a circle. As far as the east, it keeps going. Keeps going. Keeps going. When God says that he takes your sin and buries it in the deepest part of the ocean, when God says he and sin will be made as white as snow, that when God sees you, if he sees you in Jesus, he sees you just as if you'd never sinned. When God evaluated Abraham's life, he did not see his mistakes. Why? Because his mistakes were not recorded in the halls of heaven. They weren't there. Friend, I hope you know this morning that God's grace finds you. Even when you're not looking for it. And even when you don't deserve it. The the truth is is that there was nothing inherent to Abram or his character that precipitated God's appearing or his calling. God chose Abraham before Abraham chose God. And how incredible that Jesus didn't die on the cross to save you because you were worthy. I didn't get an amen. I'll just repeat it. Jesus didn't die on the cross to save you Because you were worthy. That demands an amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, it was specifically because you weren't worthy that God sent his only begotten son. Amen. Thank you. God's amazing grace and not your worthiness is the entire reason you've been afforded a relationship with him. And how sad it is we forget this blessed truth. Think of it this way. If God's first contact with you was based upon His love for you and not your worthiness, then don't you think, and isn't it logical, that the entire basis for that continued relationship with God should also be based upon His great love for you and not the fact you deserved it or are earning it? Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. To his credit, upon God's appearing, Abraham believed God's word and placed his faith in a Savior. It was the one work essential for the process. Abraham was made righteous on account, not on account of anything that he did, but by his faith in Christ. Again, Abraham goes down as the one guy known not for what he did or for what he said, but for who he knew. Finally, and we'll wrap it up with this. Did you notice in these verses, going back to to Genesis 12, that there was only one thing that God asked of Abram. Only one thing required of Abraham to ensure that he remained in the perfect will of God. One command. That would enable all these promises. God said, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, 
to a land that I will show you. Now, there's a fascinating paradigm to this. God told Abraham to get out of two. Get out of two, or as the old King James translates, get thee out of unto. Like, like the way that this verse is structured communicates the idea that Abraham was being asked in an act of faith to exchange what he presently had for something God would later give. The, the message translates this as leave for. Notice God asks Abraham to leave behind his present family. Why? <laughs> so that God can make him a great nation. Additionally, God asked him to leave behind his father's house and all the benefits that it would provide. Why? For a land that God would show him. God commanded Abraham to leave behind what he presently had for something much better that God wanted to give him. You see, Abraham had to decide what you and I have to decide. Keep the life you have and forego the life God wants to provide or forego the life you have to attain the life that God wants to provide. It's your decision. The two can only be realized if you first go out of. And notice that the, the two, it's not a specific destination. The invitation was rather to engage in a journey that would lead to a particular destination. Do you, do you notice that God was asking Abraham to engage in a journey? You know, he never stops moving. He never finds what he's looking for. He keeps moving. You read through the, the entire 10 chapters dedicated to Abraham, constantly moving even in the land of promise, constantly moving. Why? Because it wasn't about the land. It was about the journey and the destination wasn't the land. It was heaven. God invited Abraham to start a new journey with him. That was the whole thing, the whole work. A journey that would lead to a cross and then through a garden tomb before heaven. And you know what? It seems that Abraham, even in Ur, and if not in Ur, maybe later on, but Abraham, he understood what this meant. He, he understood what he would see. He definitely understood it in Genesis 22 when he was asked to make the ultimate offering, right? His only begotten son on a mountain located called Moriah where Jerusalem was built. Jesus will say in John 8, verses 56 through 58 of Abraham, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. But did he see my, what? We'll get to that. And then Jesus says, and when he saw it, oh, he was glad, he rejoiced. And so the Jews, they said to Jesus, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? So Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham ever was, he says, I am, which is a powerful statement in and of itself. And that sets the stage for a full examination of John 8, which we'll do next Sunday. So, Father, Lord, thank you for what you said to us.